Hello, let's go over chapter 12 in Biology 2E. We're going to discuss Mendel's experiments in heredity. I do have a little bit of a cold, so I apologize for the stuffy voice. So there are some pretty comical, honestly, misconceptions about heredity. Um, the first one was a joke that a lot of people now are familiar with thanks to the Big Bang Theory, and it's the concept of the homunculus. So homunculus is a perfectly formed miniature human or little human. Uh, once upon a time, they thought that individual sperm contained fully formed miniature people or little people. And when you um, when a male impregnated a female, it was one of those little people that formed. Therefore, like begot like. So offspring would have looked exactly like their parents. Obviously, we know that's not the case. You can have um, incredibly uh, diverse kids, um, beautiful mixed little ones. So... We knew that wasn't quite right, but they didn't really think about it at the time. Um, there was a little while where they thought that everything came from the egg, so you should be identical to your mom. Um, there were different concepts on the blending of inheritance and that offspring should be a perfect average, 50% one parent, 50% the other parent. There was a little while where we thought that you could be able to um, inherit acquired characteristics. So if you had a six pack, your offspring should have a six pack. If you dyed your hair red, your offspring should there, um, therefore have red hair. So very silly, very silly misconceptions, um, comical misconceptions though. So that was nice. Um, and then they thought about these ideas called pangenesis. So this was the idea that there were little particles called gemmules that carried the traits that we inherit. And that's kind of the closest to what we now know as correct. There's a fun picture. Um, this is just an article from a Swedish textbook, and you can see the tiny little man that existed uh, inside the head of a sperm. So just made me laugh. It was this guy right here, Johann Gregor Mendel, um, working in the 1800s that really led us to understand what was going on with genetics and heredity, although he didn't he wasn't recognized for his work at the time. Now we know him as the father of genetics. Uh, he was a farmer. Um, in Austria, but he couldn't really hack it due to health problems, so he decided to go to school instead. He studied philosophy, the natural sciences. Um, he entered an abbey, an Augustinian abbey called St. Thomas, and he did all of his priest trainings and then decided to teach science. That might sound a little weird, but back in the day, um, most academics were scientists because it was the church that paid for school and put people through school. He wasn't great at being an abbot, um, but he still kind of st stuck with it. Um, and he, he did both at the same time for a long time. Eventually he did gave up on science um, and ended up just focusing um, purely on his religious duties because his works weren't recognized while he was alive, like many, many, many great um people back in the day. The, their, their work was not appreciated in their time and Mendel was not alone. What he chose to study were peas and it ended up working out really well in his favor. Um, they have a lot of really simple dichotomous traits. If something is a dichotomy, it's this or that. So he looked at things like flower colors. Their flowers um, are purple. Uh, purple or white, you didn't have um, mixes. In these pictures, you can see snapdragons that are very famous for um, all of their different colors. Um, thankfully, he was able to isolate traits through true breeding. So if you only ever breed uh, purple pea plants together, you're only going to get purple pea plants. When you only ever breed white ones, you're going to stick with white ones. Um, so he had some, some traits that were very easy to follow because it was always this or that. The plants were tall or short. The seed pods were wrinkled or smoothed, one or the other. Very easy to track what things looked like. The nice thing about peas is they're also monocetious, so they have male or female parts. Um, a lot of flowers, if they're called perfect flowers, they can actually pollinate themselves. But when you have male and female flowers, it's super easy to control the matings. Um, each pea plant grew as a whole new individual and they were very easy to track and grow. So he could evaluate thousands of offspring. And one of the reasons he was able to do that was because they have really short generation times. They could grow really, really fast. So he could keep breeding different pea plants together, tracking what the parents and babies looked like, um, and just keep, keep doing it many, many, many times over and over and over again. And because they were really cheap, um, they're super easy for him to find. 
He used a special notation system, and you're going to see that in some pictures. The notation system that he used, he had the he noted um, the P generation for the parent generation. So every experiment has to start somewhere. The plants that he started with were called the parents. The first offspring from those parents were referred to as the F1 generation or the first filial. Filial means offspring. The second generation would be F2. So if you can think of this as um, if your parents were the P generation, you would be the F1 generation. If you had kids, that would be the F2 generation. Um, when you yourself became a grandparent, that would be F3. If you were um, a great grandparent, that's F4. So that's just how he tracked it. So you'll see some of those um, as you learn about Mendel and all of the things that he did. He did talk about siblings, which is exactly as you know it, brothers and sisters. Cross siblings um, or crosses with sibs would be mating between brothers and sisters. Back crosses is when you mate a parent um, with its own offspring. Again, that sounds really creepy, but remember you're talking about pea plants. Um, self crosses is when you cross a plant with itself. That is, um, it is possible to do that. And then anytime you have a cross and you say that the members of the cross are true breeding, it means that the parents always have um, the same traits as the offspring. He didn't know what that meant when he started, but he did know what it meant um, when he ended. So here's what a cross might look like. So you see the first generation is the P generation. All of those flowers look exactly the same. And the F1 generation, you can you can see that all of the offspring um, are again the same. They did an F1 cross with siblings. Oh, excuse me, with siblings, and you can see again um, it's true breeding throughout. Everyone looks exactly the same. This image is just showing you the different generations. Here's where it got kind of cool. Mendel crossed a true breeding purple plant with a true breeding white plant. So if you were to look at these plants, all of their traits were exactly the same um, with the exception of the colors of their flowers. But what he found is in the P generation, you had um, purple and white, but then in the F1 generation and their kids, all of the flowers were purple. So those plants had whatever caused them to be white in them, but for whatever reason, it wasn't showing. So what he did to create the F2 generation is he did a sibling cross. He's crossed two individuals from F1, and he found that in some instances, about 25% of the time, there would be offspring that were white. So something was occurring where the trait was hidden and then it was seen. <clears throat> so here's those results again. So in one experiment, Mendel would cross a true breeding purple with a true breeding white. F1 has all violet or purple. F2 has three quarters purple and one quarter white. And he didn't really get what was going on, but you can see some numbers attached to this idea that 25% of the time that rare phenotype was seen. So what happened exactly? And he found that blending inheritance was not a viable explanation. If you remember back to our first misconceptions, blending inheritance was that you got 50-50 traits. Clearly that wasn't an option um, because then you would have seen either 50-50 flowers or you should have seen you know, flowers that were a light purple if they were a blend of white and purple. Think about mixing paints. It didn't work that way. So he thought that um, inheritance had to be um, some sort of like particulate matter. And he realized that some versions of the traits are dominant. If you have a dominant particle, then that's the only one that you see. And the traits that can be masked, he referred to them as recessive. If you can hide a recessive trait, you very easily will. Um, he found that the recessive trait was carried in the flowers that showed dominant traits, but it, yet it was still hidden. So he kind of kept diving in to find out, you know, why are some traits masked and, and how do you make them pop up? So let's use some, some more terms really quick. There was lots of terminology when it comes to genetics, you know, as is the norm in biology. Um, so what, what Mendel was looking at we're going to refer to from here on out as traits. Traits are things like flower colors in humans. It might be your eye color. You have, you know, blue eyes or green eyes or brown eyes, um, you know, tall or short, wrinkly or smooth. Um, when we give things those labels, things that we can see, blue eyes, purple flower, brown skin, 
black skin, white skin, if you're like me, ghostly pale skin, uh, if I almost look blue in winter, that is a phenotype. Your phenotype is what you look like. When we talk about those different versions of genes, those are alleles. We have a phenotype for brown hair, a phenotype for curly hair, a phenotype for stick, stick straight thin hair like mine. <laughs> those different versions are alleles. You have the blonde allele, the black allele, the brown allele, the white allele. The alleles can be the dominant ones, or you can have a recessive allele. Now, the, all of that refers to what you look like. When we start talking about your genes and what your genes say, that is your genotype. That is a reference to those particles that Mendel realized we must have. We can say that you have homozygous genotypes. Homo is the biology word for of the same kind. So if you're a homozygote, that means that your genotype has two of the same particles, particles of the same type. So you can be homozygous dominant, you have two dominant particles, or you could be homozygous recessive, you have two recessive particles. We do use a shorthand for that, when your particles are dominant, we always write them as capital letters. And when your particles are recessive, we write them as lowercase letters. So if I was talking about a purple flower, its phenotype would be purple. And its um, genotype would have at least one big P because of that next term on our list, heterozygous, heterozygosity. Sometimes the genotype of an individual can be mixed. You can have one dominant trait and one recessive trait. That is totally normal. Uh, if you have one dominant trait, that's the trait that you see, or at least in classic Mendelian genetics. So you would have one big P, and if you're heterozygous, hetero means of different types, you would then have one little P. Big P, little P is heterozygous. If we're sticking with our purple example, that individual's phenotype, or what they look like, would be purple, because they have one big P and therefore it hides it. Um, the last item on the list is a reference to the zygote, the first diploid cell produced by fertilization. We learned about this when we talked about mitosis and meiosis. But those are some modern useful terms, and we'll keep cycling back to them because I know they sound a little weird. So you'll, you'll get to hear them a few times. Um, here are just a few more before we round out the end of this video. A gene is where um, a gene is a piece of DNA that encodes the information causing the trait. So a gene for purple petal color, a gene for wrinkly seeds. Um, genes are uh, located on chromosomes. We can say that a gene specific locus is where you can find it. So if you were looking for Phoenix, Arizona on a map, that is the locus of Phoenix on the state of Arizona. A locus is a specific location for a gene. Um, alleles, again, just to remind you where the different versions of genes. We can have reciprocal crosses. A reciprocal cross is when we cross individuals who have different alleles, different versions of the same gene. The version that's most common in the wild is referred to as the wild type, and the version that is most rare in an environment is referred to as the mutant allele. So in part two, we'll talk a little bit more about what we can do with these different things.